my name is Bill Saunders. I am the chair of the Religious Liberties Practice Group of the Federalist Society and uh, welcome you to this session. Um, I want to say uh, to, to everybody that's here, Dean was anticipating we're going to have an overflow or two rooms, so I, there's a lot of interest in religious liberty topics. And I want to invite any of you that are interested to join the practice group. Uh, we do a lot of fine programming with folks like you have up here on the podium. And uh, hopefully you're subscribing or getting the podcasts or listening to the teleforums. Um, but I invite you to join it and become active. Uh, some of you, I just want to take one second to say, some of you know me um, personally, and I am now at Catholic University working with an institute, a uh, new institute there, uh, called the Institute on Human Ecology, which is not about ecology as such. But anyway, there are brochures about it at the back of the room. I'm establishing a program uh, in human rights, and I'm working with one of our panelists, Mark Rienzi, at the law school to establish a new center for religious freedom. So if you're interested in that, uh, I just these brochures are at the back of the room. And now it's my pleasure to turn over the panel for, uh, to our moderator and great friend of the Federalist Society, Judge O'Scanlan of the Ninth Circuit. Thank you very, very much, and welcome to everybody. This is a lovely afternoon, and um, we have a very interesting panel on the administrative state and religious freedom. Although the convention's overarching theme of administrative agencies and the regulatory state touches almost every area of law and policy imaginable, many of the administrative actions in the last several years that have been most debated in both the courts and in the public have concerned the effect of the administrative agency's decisions on religious liberties. <laughs> For examples, we need look no farther than some of the highest profile cases on the Supreme Court's recent docket. In the last three years, for example, it has been asked to weigh in on faith-based objections to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services contraceptive mandate, and that's more than once. Then there's a Missouri State Agency's denial of public grants to church-affiliated programs. And this year, a Colorado State Commission's enforcement of public accommodations laws over a free exercise objection. Fortunately, we are blessed to have four speakers today with a wealth of knowledge and experience to help us better understand this complicated and at times quite controversial subject area. Their biographies are set forth in your program, so I won't repeat them here. Roger Severino, who is director of the Office for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, will lead off by addressing the broader context of the topic, discussing the concordant rise of public secularism and the administrative state. Melissa Rogers, a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, will then discuss differences in how Congress and administrative agencies approach issues touching on religious liberty and comment on the administration's new contraceptive rules, religious freedom guidance, and the travel ban. Next, Professor Mark Rienzi of the Columbus School of Law at Catholic University and senior counsel at the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty will discuss the contraceptive and transgender related mandates from the Department of Health and Human Services and their relationship to the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Finally, Professor Bill Marshall, 
who is the William Rand Cannon, Jr. Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of North Carolina, will discuss the question of FEMA's policy respecting disaster aid to churches and the broader question of whether religious rights, as distinct from other rights, have a special role to play in the administrative decision making. Each speaker will begin with opening remarks of eight to 10 minutes. Those will be followed by a brief period for members of the panel to respond to one another right here. And that will be followed then by questions from the floor as is the custom at these gatherings. We will begin with Mr. Severino. Thank you, Judge O'Scanlan, and thank you to the Federal Society for inviting me to speak on one of my favorite topics, which is religious liberty and the administrative state. I was recently reading an article in Physics Today, of all things, from a couple scientists from Los Alamos who were studying the effects of radiation and the survivability of certain objects and things, and they concluded that the two things most likely to survive a nuclear war are Twinkies and federal agencies. <laughs> so federal agencies are here to stay. Uh, they're a part and parcel of life. I'm a member of one of them at HHS. But the question arises, what is the proper role of our federal agencies, particularly in their interaction with religious freedom? It is my honor to be a member of an administration that is dedicated to religious freedom and of reining in the excesses of the administrative state to return it to its constitutional moorings. The thesis of my talk today is fairly simple. It is that as the state tends to grow, religious liberty tends to shrink. There is a crowding out effect. But context here matters greatly. We are currently in a context of general religious decline in terms of religious identification. Some statistics could be enlightening. In the late 1940s and 50s, only about two or three percent of the American public did not identify with a religious tradition. In the 70s and 80s, there was an uptick to about one in 10. In 1990, it reached over 10 percent. In the 2000s, it reached the teens. As of September 2016, it grew to around 23 percent, or about one in four adults that do not identify with religion. And the main reason they give for this change is that they simply do not believe. It, is, it comes down to that, a lack of belief. As more and more people do not identify with religious belief, there's another um, uh, context that is happening at the same time. And that has to do with those that retain the religious beliefs. What is happening with them? Well, what we see with them is that they are banding together and finding common ground in a way that we have not seen uh, perhaps ever in, in American history. A hundred years ago, the level of cooperation, and friendship, and, and um, mutual organizations between Catholics and Protestants, Jews and Muslims, simply didn't exist like it exists now. So as religious believers band together on these common grounds, we're also seeing a bit of a separation with those that do not believe. And I'm gonna focus on a subset of that, and that is those that have more of a secularist um, mentality or secularist worldview. So people of faith tend to um, see that their religious identity is integrated with their sense of self. So they do not simply turn it on and off like a light switch. It's not simply something that's done on a Saturday or a Sunday, but part of everyday life. Whereas secularists who don't participate in that way may have their own set of moral commitments but do not see the religious value, do not see the intrinsic worth of those who have religious faith. And when they start expressing religious faith in the public square, it could be seen as a nuisance, make somebody uncomfortable. And in some cases, it could be seen as a form of a threat or a challenge to a public good, to a vision of our common, common good. An analogy is that some treat religious belief and expression a bit like secondhand smoke. You could do it in the privacy of your own home, but please don't take it outside, don't put it around me, and don't let the children see it. 
At the same time as religious belief is waning, the administrative state is growing. And in many ways, it's displacing religious motivated activities, particularly charitable activities. There are currently about two million federal bureaucrats. And the greatest amount of administrative growth has also taken place at the state and local level, where we now have about 18 million government workers. And much of this growth was driven by federal money, federal grants going to the states, as the value of federal grants have grown about tenfold since the 1960s. We have these moving forces of secularism, growth of the administrative state. I contend that has led to more friction with religious institutions. And I think that is epitomized most clearly by the litigation and conflict over the contraceptive mandate that the Affordable Care Act uh, imposed. We'll be hearing more about it, um, but I don't wanna dive into the details right now, but I do wanna say that the overarching point is that had there been no Affordable Care Act, there would have been no federal contraceptive mandate, period. And more than this, the Affordable Care Act itself did not specify that you must cover contraceptives, abortion-inducing drugs, anything of the sort. It really wrote a blank check to the agencies to impose its own vision of what it means to be an agency pushing the public good in the healthcare space, and even defer to non-government entities um, in coming up with the contraceptive mandate. And more than that, it then decided, okay, these are the religious groups we'll consider sufficiently religious to get the mandate for, and these are not, and making all these distinctions, which never would have had to be made had there been no Affordable Care Act to begin with. It is no surprise then that there's a conflict when the federal government takes a view of the public good that differs with organizations of religious faith. So what can be done? First and most immediately, the federal agencies have to look at what they're doing themselves. Okay? We're, we're the ones who um, make the rules in many ways, and we're the ones who have to guard it ourselves. The project, the reg regulatory rollback, is well underway under this administration. There have been numerous executive orders requiring the agencies to take a very hard look at what we are doing, the burdens we are imposing, seeing if there are any rules and regulations that are outdated, no longer apply, to see if they are fully justified. We have a two-for-one rule now, where for every federal regulation, agencies have to repeal two. Um, these are all great developments for shrinking down the regulatory state. On the issue of religious freedom in particular, the president in May, in a Rose Garden ceremony, announced and signed a new religious freedom executive order, which put the administration firmly on the side of religious freedom, directed HHS to revisit the HHS contraceptive mandate, and very recently, we issued two interim final rules protecting the rights of religious institutions and organizations of moral conviction. So that burden has been finally lifted. Additionally, there have been renewed efforts to enforce the Weldon Amendment, the Church Amendment, the Coates Snow Amendments that protect conscience, that prohibit coercion, that create space in a pluralistic society where we have disagreement on hot button issues, where there is no discrimination. My office in particular, the Office for Civil Rights, enforces that. We are in business. We are taking complaints on those issues. So as you see, these are just the first steps. Um, and I'd be remiss not to mention that the Department of Justice, the Attorney General, has issued religious freedom guidance for the agencies to follow, to implement the principles elucidated by our president, um, and also to guide the federal agencies in their rulemaking to always be solicitous of religious interests and of moral conviction. It's important to realize that institutions and groups of faith that are driven by faith to participate in the public square, to serve the poor, hungry, sick, infirm, people with mental disabilities, HIV, um, religious institutions are on the front lines of these efforts. But it's that very same faith that drives them to pursue the common good in that way. It's that very same faith that will say no if the government says you must drop your religious identity or we will fine you, or we will take away your grants, or your tax exempt status, or even threaten you with jail time. It's two sides of the same faith coin for many of these organizations and organizations of moral conviction. So what happens when the state starts imposing its own rules on these issues? The risk is that religious institutions will withdraw, and those services will start to diminish to the tune of 1.2 trillion, according to faithcounts.com. 
if religious activity, faith-based activity was a separate country, it'd be around the 15th largest country in the world. It would have a tremendous impact on our economy if faith groups retreated. If faith groups retreat, what would happen? Government would step in. Then you'd have more government, more regulations, more crowding out, and the cycle continues. James Madison foresaw this problem when he said in Federalist 51, in framing a government, which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. There's always a temptation for the government to impose its own view of the common good. But the Declaration of Independence did not guarantee an inalienable right to government-provided happiness, but freedom for the pursuit of happiness. We're committed as an administration, as a federal government, to make sure that pursuit is in the hands of private parties, especially on matters of conscience, faith, and moral convictions, a source of happiness to millions, and when oppressed, a suppressed, a source of misery to those whose rights are violated. The provision of government services and the preservation of freedom all can be done, so long as we keep the admonition of James Madison in mind and his solution, the Constitution. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the Federalist Society for the invitation to be here, Bill Saunders, and uh, also our distinguished moderator, Judge O'Scanlan. It's a great honor to be on this panel with such talented colleagues. Well, as, as we've been discussing, the First Amendment requires the government to respect and protect religious freedom, neither establishing it nor prohibiting its free exercise. And that's a challenging job at any time, but perhaps especially today, for at least three reasons. First, Americans of a dizzying array of religions live out their faith in countless ways every day. Second, government regulation can be extensive, which increases the number of times at which faith and government will intersect. Third, many religion-related issues are quite sensitive. Americans are increasingly divided over some of them, and political polarization generally is on the rise. So protecting religious freedom today, therefore, is absolutely necessary and sometimes deeply challenging. And in contrast to Roger, I would say that we can have a robust state and robust religious liberty, but it does require care and dedication. And that's, of course, part of what uh, the executive branch does. And I'll talk mostly about the executive branch at the federal level because that's the uh, level of government with which I'm most familiar. The executive branch of government will necessarily handle many religious liberty instance issues in the first instance. And that's because legislatures simply cannot address the multitude of issues that arise on a regular basis across government. And, you know, bodies like Congress certainly aren't set up to handle the minutia that's often associated with implementing statutes and enforcing the law of the land in the real world. Thus, it's imperative that the executive branch takes this role seriously and not as an afterthought. And it's also imperative that the executive branch seeks consistency across government on religious liberty issues. And this is particularly important, as Roger mentioned, for those uh, religious and faith-based uh, and other community-based providers who shouldn't have to follow a different set of rules from different agencies um, just because the agencies say so. We ought to try wherever possible to bring about uh, the, the most consistent interpretations, especially for those who work and serve the vulnerable in our society, including the poor. Especially in this polarized time, however, it would be helpful, I believe, to have bipartisan guidance from legislatures on religious liberty issues. Legislatures are politically diverse, and when they come together across party lines to protect religious freedom, it greatly strengthens that liberty. Also, legislatures have high-profile tools like hearings and floor debates, formal and transparent ways in which members of the public can engage and everyone can become better educated. And legislation is usually more durable than executive action. And I think if at all possible, we want to avoid radical policy and legal change every four to eight years with our politics, 
which can be quite costly in many ways. If we don't get such bipartisan legislative leadership, and I'll be honest, it seems like we're not likely to get that from Congress anytime soon, then I think it's particularly important for the executive branch to do what it can to seek common ground among religious liberty advocates with diverse views. This too will help us to minimize radical policy and legal change every four to eight years and build confidence in law and policy. And we have some precedent for this approach. For example, uh, the, I'm old enough to remember the Clinton administration and its development uh, and common ground work to produce consensus statements on religious expression in the public schools and the federal workplace. We actually have one of our panelists, Bill Marshall, to thank, among others, for this work. And the Obama administration issued an executive order on regulations on faith-based partnerships that were based on the unanimous recommendation of an advisory council with serious differences on some church-state issues. These common ground efforts helped to make law and policy making more stable and durable and helped Americans to come together across our deeper, deepest differences and find ways to live together. So in my view, every administration should use mechanisms like these to build more common ground. In the spirit of seeking common ground, I'd also like to offer a, some brief comments on a few policies of the current administration. Roger mentioned some um, Department of Justice guidance that has recently been issued on religious liberty issues. Uh, the guidance rightly calls on the federal executive branch to give serious attention to church state issues and seek consistency on them within the context of federal policy making and enforcement. It also contains many fair descriptions of federal, of federal law that I think everyone um, who cherishes religious freedom should be able to endorse, including references to the Clinton and Obama initiatives that I cited earlier. At the same time, I think other aspects of the guidance deepen our raging culture war. For example, the guidance gives very fulsome treatment to the free exercise clause, but it treats the establishment clause uh, very, uh, in a very limited way, giving it short shrift. And also I think that there are times at which the guidance uh, undervalues equality and non-discrimination principles and presents some contested issues as settled law. So I think we need to work on these efforts to try to build more common ground, building on the earlier models that I mentioned. Roger also mentioned, and I'd like to briefly address the new contraception rules from the Department of Health and Human Services. Now, unlike Roger, I'm sure it won't be surprising for you to find that I'm a supporter of the ACA and also of its contraception mandate. I support the contraception mandate for many reasons, uh, but let me just mention one. One is that I believe when contraception is made easily accessible uh, to women, then we end up with less unintended pregnancies and fewer abortions, and that's something that's very important to me. Well, I think that these um, new rules, I, they, they, uh, they do a lot of different things, and I'll just talk about them very briefly now. I want to mention that since 2011, I have called for religious organizations to be exempted from the ACA's contraception mandate, while also insisting that women working for objecting employers should receive such coverage by other means. So I certainly support exemptions for religious organizations, but I believe it's very important to ensure that we uh, get this federally mandated benefit to women who want it, who work for objecting employers. In my view, the new rules badly miss the mark by allowing even publicly traded corporations to exempt themselves from these requirements while making no attempt to ensure that female employees of objecting employers receive cost-free contraception coverage, which again is a benefit that they're entitled to under federal law. Finally, the travel ban, and because time is short, I'll just say one quick word about it. While we can argue over various, whether the various versions of the ban pass legal or constitutional muster, everyone who values religious freedom should be deeply disturbed by the fact that a candidate for the presidency of the United States uh, called for, during the campaign, called for Muslims to be denied entry to our country and has never apologized for or disavowed those comments. No one can be a champion for religious freedom when they engage in rank discrimination against an entire faith group. 
Let me conclude. Roger discussed the growing secularization of society and some ways in which that may threaten religious freedom. But threats to religious freedom also come from other directions. If religions, religious freedom is only for some faiths, not for all faiths, then it's not really religious freedom. If the Establishment Clause is treated like the inferior religion clause, religious freedom will suffer. If religious exemptions have to include publicly traded corporations, then there often won't be any religious exemptions. And if the government is said to violate the First Amendment every time it treats, treats churches or other houses of worship differently than other religious organizations, then we will undo some needed protections for religious freedom. And if human rights claims that clash with religious freedom are treated dismissively, including claims for LGBT equality and reproductive rights, then no one should be surprised when religious liberty claims get that same kind of dismissive treatment. And I think it's wrong to dismiss all of these types of claims. We they, instead, we should take them very seriously. Claims for religious liberty and claims for equality and non-discrimination and deal with those uh, clashes, as painful as they are, uh, in appropriate ways, depending on the context that we confront them in. So let's consider threats to religious liberty from all sides. And let's once again come together across our differences to seek common ground and to promote religious freedom for all people. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Mark? Thank you, Judge O'Scanlan. Thank you to the Federal Society and to these uh, esteemed panelists and to you all for, for listening. Um, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about clashes between the administrative state and religious liberty and talk a little bit about how those clashes are sometimes different and can be more frequent than clashes with government authority when wielded by a legislature or other elected officials. Um, so we're thinking about the power of the administrative state um, Roger Severino talked about the number of uh, government bureaucrats in the country, 2 million at the federal level, 18 million at the state and local level. Um, there are a lot of people who go to work in government every day, um, good people trying to do good things, um, but their job is to wield agency power. And generally speaking, when people are wielding government power um, through an agency, they remain subject to the exact same constitutional limitations that regulate when Congress or a legislature is acting. And they remain subject to the exact same federal civil rights laws, like the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, that apply when Congress or any other part of the government is acting. Um, and those laws, when properly applied, don't say that religion always wins. It doesn't. Uh, but they do say that when the government is going to burden somebody's religion, when it's going to make someone violate her religion, the government needs to have a very good reason to do that and it needs to not have other available ways to achieve its goals. In that way, our religious freedom laws, our free exercise clause, our First Amendment protect the minority from the power of the majority. And I would suggest that was, was and has always been their point and that's, that remains their function today. Let me point out two big differences that come into play when you're talking about agency power and how it comes into conflict with religious liberty. Um, Unlike legislators who tend to be generalists, right? Legislators have to get elected by a broad swath of the public. Legislators have to work on a lot of different issues. Legislators have to cobble together majorities to pass a bill into a law. Um, unlike legislators and other elected officials, agency bureaucrats tend to be single-minded. Um, that's not all of them, but that is the nature of the job, right? They go to work every day with a fairly narrow mandate, improve health care. Um, protect equal opportunity in the workplace, regulate securities, right? The job of somebody who works at an agency tends to be a narrow focus on a particular goal. I would suggest that that makes agencies more likely, more likely to ignore or not know about or not care enough about competing interests like minority religious rights. Secondly, agencies by nature are further removed from the electorate. They're further removed from the people. And so that means that sometimes 
governments will use agencies to do things that they could never do through the elected branches. To give just two examples from the last administration, um, a mandate that requires the Little Sisters of the Poor to provide their employees with insurance for abortion-inducing drugs is something that never did and, and I hope never would be able to pass Congress, but it was imposed by the Department of Health and Human Services. And late in the Obama administration, a regulation was issued to require religious hospitals to both provide abortions, or else they'd be guilty of sex discrimination, according to the government, and provide sex change operations, or else they'd be guilty of LGBT discrimination. Um, these types of things may be popular with the base. I would suggest they are not things that would ever pass a legislature of generalists. Um, and they end up being things that may be useful and pleasing to the base, but are actually ultimately quite damaging to the country. Um, what they result in is often long, unavoidable, tense partisan divide. Um, that is completely unnecessary. And if you step back just to take the contraception example, um, if you start out with the premise that contraception is awesome and really important um, and say, boy, I want to make sure every woman in America who wants it gets it, um, it would take you a very long time to get to and therefore I need nuns. Right? It is not logical and it doesn't make sense to say we need nuns to give out contraception. Um, there are other ways to do it. Um, from the dawn of time to 2012, <laughs> from the dawn of time to 2012, lots of people got contraception. Very, very few of them got it from the Little Sisters of the Poor. <laughs> um, let me briefly talk about the contraceptive mandate and the Little Sisters, because I do think it, it tends to point out the problems that get created by agency power um, ignoring religious liberty. Um, first, one of the things that happened in the litigation, and I think this is because agencies tend to be single-minded and specialists, um, is the agencies got an awful lot of deference from the federal courts. They got deference about how their accommodation worked, right? They said they had an accommodation that should make it okay for the Little Sisters of the Poor. Um, ultimately, that accommodation gave religious groups flexibility about how abortion-inducing drugs would be added to their health plans, but no flexibility about whether it would be added to their health plans. In other words, the government said, instead of you writing it in, sister, we'll write it in from the side, but one way or the other, that health plan that you give your employee is going to come with the drugs. Um, for a long time in the lower courts, uh, the lower federal courts simply accepted on the government's argument their description of how this system worked and that it was really a separate plan. Um, what ultimately happened when the case got to the Supreme Court is that, to their great credit, the Solicitor General's office in the Department of Justice um, started telling the truth to the Supreme Court. And they told two very important truths that really um, dictated the outcome of that case and guaranteed that ultimately, no matter who won the election, the contraceptive mandate, at least the part that forced the religious institutions to participate, would have to lose. First, after insisting to courts across the country and having federal judges across the country buy the argument, that the contraceptives are separate from your plan. It's got nothing to do with your plan. Don't worry, sister, just sign the piece of paper. Um, the Solicitor's General, Solicitor General's office ultimately admitted to the Supreme Court that it was actually part of the same plan. The religious people were actually right after all. It was part of the same plan. Well, that completely undermined the argument the government had given to countless federal courts on the way up, um, and it resulted that by the end, by the time we got to the argument, the Solicitor General was essentially trying to give up on, their, on his substantial burden argument such that uh, Justice Kennedy and I think Justice Ginsburg both interrupted and said, so you are giving up on the substantial burden argument now. Um, the second, and I would suggest even more important change that the Solicitor General's office made when the case finally got to the Supreme Court is they acknowledged that, no big surprise, there are lots of other ways for people to get contraceptives. Now, the government didn't do this in the context of saying, and therefore the Little Sisters of the Poor should get off the hook. They should have, but they didn't. Instead, they did it in the context of defending much, much, much larger exemptions. So the administration in the Affordable Care Act had written in an exemption for grandfathering of plans. That helped the law get passed politically because you could say, if you like your plan, you can keep your plan, right? That was the pitch. Um, and as a result of that, by the time the case got to the Supreme Court, someplace north of 25 million people were still on grandfathered plans that were not subject to the contraceptive mandate. And actually, I apologize, by the time that one got to the Supreme Court, it was still 100 million people, by the time the Little Sisters were at the Supreme Court, 100 million people were on plans not covered by this mandate. 
And the administration needed to explain to the court, well, why isn't that a problem? Why is it not a problem that there's 100 million people not covered by this mandate if it's so important? And what the Solicitor General said to the Supreme Court in writing in their brief, page 65, um, <laughs> is that there are lots of other ways for women to get contraceptives. They said if your employer doesn't give it to you, you can get on a family member, on the plan of a family member's employer. You can go to our exchanges and get a plan. You can buy one on the open market. You can participate in a government program like Medicaid or Medicare to get a plan. They said, don't worry about those 100 million people. There's a lot of other ways to get it. Well, once the agencies ultimately admitted that to the Supreme Court, of course, the game was up. And it should be up. Because ultimately, again, there's no reason to think that you can't both have access to contraceptives, if you want to have access to contraceptives, and nuns who want to care for the elderly poor and still stay Catholic, right? Like, we are a big enough country that it's easy to achieve those things, and we can have both. Um, let me end with a silver lining, with a silver lining about the clash between agency power and religious liberty. Um, these cases are still actually going. The contraceptive mandate cases are not finally resolved. Um, several blue state attorney generals have now sued to get rid of the new interim final rule and to reimpose the contraceptive mandate, so they've essentially kept the issue alive. But in the course of keeping the issue alive, they have done much what the Obama administration did to the Supreme Court, which is they have said, when trying to argue about why they have an interest in the case, we have an interest in the case because we have all of these other programs that give people contraceptives. We have all of these state-run programs to give people contraceptives, and if the little sisters don't do it, then we're gonna have to do it. And that is, again, very similar to what the Obama administration acknowledged to the Supreme Court. And here's why the administrative agencies end up being a silver lining. It is precisely because of the huge, enormous size of our administrative state that the government has a million tools in the toolkit. The government has a lot of tools in the toolkit. And so when the government comes in and says, gosh, the only way I can get people's contraception is if I use nuns, um, they're ultimately going to lose those cases, and they should lose those cases. We have a very large government with a lot of administrative power and a lot of tools in the toolkit, and of course they can achieve their objectives without steamrolling religious people. So the administrative state can coexist with religious liberty. It requires them to actually pay attention to their obligations under the Constitution and federal law, and it requires them, instead of single-mindedly pursuing their goals, to pause and think, wait, I'm actually an officer of the government, I have obligations to protect people who may have different beliefs than mine, and I'm supposed to use one of my many other tools in the toolkit and not steamroll religious liberty. Um, if we would do that, we would have a lot less unnecessary, long-term, uh, tough litigation and long-term culture war fighting. This is the best example of a wildly unnecessary culture war fight. You just didn't need nuns to give out contraceptives. If you're serious about it, you can easily have both access um, and religious liberty. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Bill. Hi, and thank you. Um, let me first of all thank my fellow panelists. It is terrific to be on a panel with some of the most leading, thoughtful people in this area in the country, and I am honored and flattered to be there. Um, thanks to Bill Saunders for putting on a good program, as he does every year, and mostly as a board member of the American Constitution Society, I want to thank the Federalist Society for inviting me here because one of the great privileges, one of the great things that I really admire about this group is that you really do want to listen to what other people have to say. And in the climate that we are living in right now, we need people on both sides of the political spectrum who will listen to what the other side has to say, even if they end up disagreeing with them. I mean, I have spoken before this group a number of times. As far as I know, I haven't convinced anybody. but. Uh, <laughs> But I do appreciate that at least people are listening, and, and we all need to do that. Um, Thanksgiving next week, happy Thanksgiving. But when I was thinking about that, I was thinking about a song by Arlo Guthrie called Alice's Restaurant. I don't know how many of you ever heard Alice's Restaurant. It's a great little ballad. It goes for about 15 minutes. The first part of it is he talks about this great Thanksgiving dinner that he had in Massachusetts. And then after going through this beautiful song for a while, he says, but that's not what I came here to talk to you about. I came here to talk to you about the draft. And so what I want to do for a moment is talk to you about the draft. Just, Judge O'Scanlan correctly pointed out 
that there have been a lot of religious liberty fights recently, mostly dealing with the culture wars, and we know which side people have been on the culture wars with respect to the contraceptive and gay marriage debates. With respect to conscientious objection, we can flip who exactly was on one side and who exactly was on the other because it was liberals who were fighting to protect religious freedom for the most part and conservatives, particularly political conservatives who weren't crazy about people seeking things like conscientious exemption to the draft. There were some key cases decided during the Vietnam War that actually the CO status had been around uh, in World War I and World War II. There were very few people who applied for it. By the way, for a while, you could get CO status not just if you had a religious objection to it, but simply if you were a minister, you were entitled to get CO status. By the time the Vietnam War came around, there were a number of folks who challenged the existing limits on who got CO status. It was limited to those who had conscience objection to all wars. And it was based on, you had to have a, by religious training. In two cases, Seeger and Welch, the Supreme Court expanded the definition of religion to include people, in one case of Welch, who actually crossed out religion as a reason why they sought conscientious objection. But the court, thinking very expansively, uh, uh, allowed those who had, their re who had secular beliefs against the war, which occupied the same place that religious beliefs might occupy it. And I've always wondered of the anatomy of that, by the way. Where exactly is that place? But they allowed folks who had comparable beliefs to have conscientious objection status. But the key case that I want to talk about for my purpose is a case called Gillette versus United States. Gillette versus United States was a challenge by a number of folks who wanted CO status, but they did not have an objection to all wars. They had an objection to unjust wars. And theologians in the audience know that that is a particularly Catholic position with respect to CO status. So part of the claim raised by, raised by uh, the challengers to the limitation that folks with unjust wars shouldn't get exemption was that it constituted a sect preference. The court rejected that argument uh, even, and said it just looks like a sect preference, but it's just, it's just a gerrymander that might reflect it, but it's not explicitly on, on, uh, on sectarian basis. And then went on to discuss general establishment and free exercise problems. And interestingly to me, the number one reason why the court upheld uh, the, the limitation that you could only get a conscientious objection status if you objected to all wars was administrability. During this period, as you know, in the Vietnam War, a lot of people wanted to get out of a war that they thought was unjust. And, uh, and, had re and many of them had deeply held religious beliefs as to why they thought this particular war was unjust. But the court said, how can we go around or how can the Selective Service Administration determine when people are, be, are, are, are objecting to a, war, a particular war because they might think it's just at one moment and they might not think it's just at the other moment. And to allow this kind of play in the joints, they suggested, and this was the number one reason why they upheld it, would look unfair. That when you are asking people to sacrifice so much, you need particularly stringent fairness. And it was just too loose of a standard, the court said, to allow objections to unjust wars. Justice Scalia in Smith raised similar arguments as to why he thought there should not be a constitutionally compelled religious exemption. As he pointed out, you can have a religious belief in anything. Uh, any law can be challenged on that you can have a religious belief that you need to pollute. You can have a religious belief, in one case is true, that you need to dress up like a chicken in order to go to court. That's a, that's a real case. You can have a religious belief uh, that you shouldn't even have to file a request for a religious belief. It is impossible, although I agree with law what Mark said, it is impossible for anybody to anticipate every possible religious belief that can be presented 
against a neutral law. At some point, somebody has got to decide it can't be a court every time and it certainly can't be a legislature that's going to anticipate every possible, see, uh, uh, every possible way that an exemption can be, uh, can be sought on religious grounds. And that exactly is what Justice Scalia is worried about. Now, in the case of Gillette, they had a choice. They could either say that everybody will just defer to what the religious belief is of anybody coming in, at which case, at which point, the search for government manpower would have been seriously diminished if everybody could have sought a CO status at that point, or they could have done what they end up having to do, which is evaluate particular claims. And that is a serious, very difficult business that was around in the 1960s just as much as it is around today. We can't get out of it, even if it would be nice to think that somehow we can get out of it. And I don't even know exactly what deference to religion means in this context. Does it mean we always take the religious believer at their word? If, if, certainly if that was true during the, during the Vietnam War, there would have been a lot more conscientious objectors than there ended up, there ended up being. So that's the problem, I think. Government will, if government is going to exempt religion at all, it's going to get into these very difficult decisional areas which they can't always anticipate how, uh, how they're going to apply things, particularly with something as completely subjective as religion. And Gillette went into that in great detail, uh, how subjective religious claims actually are. All right, now let me go to Houston because I want to talk about this coming from the other side in the context of Hurricane Harvey. Uh, as, you, as you may well know that there is, a, there is, a, there is a, uh, a suit going on by a number of churches who are challenging the fact that if you are a religious, uh, if you are a religious organization, you are not entitled to get disaster funds. The reason, this is not like the, the, uh, the Trinity Lutheran case, by the way because it's not just religions that, don't, that get excluded from getting disaster assistance. Eligible services include primary and secondary education, medical assistance, childcare, alcohol, alcohol and drug treatment, and, and other kinds of programs. But FEMA prohibits disaster assistance if the nonprofit provides ineligible services, such as vocational training, political education, athletic activities and religious activities. And the reason why FEMA makes this distinction is that they're trying to conclude, they're trying to decide what kinds of activities benefit the general public in general assist in uh, disaster assistance and what kind of activities are just limited to helping a certain constituent group. That's how they made their choice. Uh, as you may know, President Trump has suggested that maybe he is going to reverse that and allow churches in some circumstances to get disaster relief. Let me suggest that either way is constitutional if FEMA makes the appropriate findings. Because the question here isn't a matter of evaluating religion. The question is, is our religious organizations providing the same kind of secular services that other non-religious organizations are providing in disaster aid? FEMA, as a current, under its current policy, has decided they're not. It seems to me that is a reasonable conclusion. Uh, it may be that we could look at this more closely, and FEMA might, might be able to decide that no, they actually are providing very similar circumstances because they're not just helping a small constituency, they're doing broader disaster aid. That would also be a reasonable conclusion. And so it seems to me that whether we like it or not, administrative agencies are going to have to decide the secular question on aid programs. Are the religious organizations performing the same kind of functions? Because that's the test that the court is using for when aid to religion doesn't violate the uh, establishment clause. So thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Bill. You've heard from four great panelists. We have a few moments here when we can continue the discussion at the panel level.
I believe uh, Roger wants to make a comment, and then if anyone else wants to reply or question other members of the panel, I may proceed. Roger. Thank you. Uh, to respond to Melissa's point about businesses and corporations and religious expression, the government generally should not take into account the organization of how people choose to unite their forces when doling out constitutional rights. There should, no, there should not be any doling out of constitutional rights to begin with. So for example, in certain states, uh, when I last checked, New York required organizations that are religious to incorporate as a corporation soul. So a lot of dioceses are organized uh, in the name of a bishop as a corporation soul. Do they then relinquish the First Amendment rights simply because they chose that and sometimes are required to um, incorporate? And in, in other aspects, we see that there, there's no conflict with giving personality to corporations or businesses. Isn't it great that you could sue a corporation and haul them into court if you know, a, a FedEx truck runs over somebody, right? Um, there's no person that shows up. It's, it's a corporation that shows up. Um, there should be space for everybody to express their religious beliefs regardless of how they're organized. So the, the opposite would be problematic. If, for example, we required organizations to only serve people of the same religion, and then you're gonna get protections, or only hire people of the same religion, and then only get protections. You can't run a business and have a, a more religious beliefs, but it has to be very particular. What's gonna happen? You're gonna crowd out those folks who want to serve everyone, that are motivated by their religious belief to serve everyone. So we saw Hobby Lobby and organizations like that who are, are there to serve as many as they can in their own way, and they don't shed their identity when, when they're making a living. Um, and the fear that Hilton is somehow gonna change their policies on contraceptive coverage, simply because there, there's an interim final rule that they're gonna somehow discover a religious belief that the Hilton Corporation now wants to, I just don't see that happening. It, it, it's really gonna be the hobby lobbies of the world, and those are very limited in number, and, and those rights should be protected. Any response or other comment? Melissa. Yes, thanks, Roger. Um, well, let me make sure that I'm clear. I certainly and have always supported the uh, ability of all religious organizations to be exempt from the contraception mandate, as I said. And I think there was an initial part of the policy that uh, tried to make some distinction based on religious organizations and who they served and the like, whether they mostly served people of their own faith as opposed to serving people of many different faiths. And I always took very serious issue with that as being an inappropriate way to judge whether an organization was in fact religious or not, because I know my Catholic friends often say we serve people not because we're trying to make them Catholic, but because we're Catholic. And so it's very important to ensure that organizations like that are included among the uh, what an agency would consider to be a religious organization. And of course we have Hobby Lobby who, where the court has ruled that closely held for profits can uh, and should be excused from the obligation to provide uh, contraception care that services to which they object. I worry about this extension to publicly traded corporations. I'm just not sure that it's really possible for a publicly traded corporation and the shareholders there to get together around a religious purpose and have a religious purpose. And, and so one of the things that, that uh, concerns me about the rule is that there's no evaluation of whether this for-profit corporation is actually expressing a, you know, a religious belief. They just are able to exempt themselves without any kind of review. Um, also, I think to the extent that we um, say, like in the legislative context, are going to say that religious exemptions have to include uh, publicly traded for-profit corporations, I think what we will often end up with is, as I said, no religious exemption as all, including no religious exemption for religious organizations because that'll be a bridge too far for many legislat legislators. And then lastly, I just say, and this goes to some comments by Mark as well, I certainly agree with Mark that there are many ways to deliver contraception services to women without uh, asking religious organizations to do that. One of the things that I was surprised and disappointed by in the new rules is that there was no, having said that in the briefing, um, those who were 
On the opposite side of the government, in the Zubik cases and Hobby Lobby cases, for example, did not, in the new rules, make any attempt to ensure that women would get contraception services. They cited some government programs, like Medicaid, who, that's on the government's chopping block, actually, um, but they did not uh, make any attempt to ensure that women would get access to this federally mandated benefit. And not even urging Congress, for example, to expand Title X uh, so that more women would get, all women who didn't get uh, contraception coverage through the ACA uh, would, as it's currently constituted, would get that coverage uh, by another means. So I was disappointed to see that because I do believe what Mark said, that we can get this contraception coverage to women without asking religious organizations that object to doing so, and that by doing that, we can play a really important role in curbing unintended pregnancies and abortions. Any other comment? Yes, go ahead. Um, so I, I would just suggest that um, I agree with Melissa that the new rule didn't announce any new particular program to provide contraceptives. Um, but I would also say that that simply makes employees of religious organizations on par with employees of Pepsi and Visa and New York City and all the other hundred million people who throughout the Obama administration were not on a plan covered by the contraceptive mandate. Now, there, there's two possibilities as to why the Obama administration allowed that to go forward. Um, one is that they don't really care about contraceptives. It doesn't sound terribly likely to me. I, I think they probably do care about contraceptive access. The other alternative is that the reason the government was perfectly comfortable with all that grandfathering and all those people who didn't have contraceptive mandate coverage in their plans is that the government knew full well that there's a lot of other ways for people to get it, and it's just not that expensive. And so the new Trump IFR does give a religious exemption, and it does leave the employees who willingly go to work for obviously religious groups, um, left to figure out how else they might get con contraception, but they're figuring out in a world where contraception is widely and cheaply available, and that's the world in which the Obama administration was perfectly comfortable leaving 100 million other people, and the idea that the only employees we should suddenly be concerned about and we need a special program for are the folks who work for religious groups um, just doesn't make that much sense. Uh, secondly, I'd also point out that I agree publicly traded companies, like Melissa said, are highly unlikely to come together and form a, a religious belief and say that a publicly traded company is exercising religion. I think that's pretty unlikely. I don't think it's impossible, but I think it's unlikely. Um, the next case of it is going to be the first case of it, though, right? We don't have examples of it happening. We don't have examples of people making the claim. Um, three years ago, you may, may remember the Hobby Lobby case, and you re may remember that everybody who was a critic of the case told you the sky is going to fall because, boy, all of these businesses are going to come forward and make religious exemption claims. And, you know, the clock's ticking, right? It's three years later. It just hasn't materialized. Um, I'd suggest that's because not many businesses are exercising a religion. The ones that do are relatively expected, um, and it hasn't created anything like the big deal that, that we thought. And last point, just a quick response to Bill on Justice Scalia's concerns in the Smith opinion about the difficulties of living in a world where all religious exercises are judged against the compelling interest standard. I would just say Congress, under the Clinton administration, enacted RIFRA, um, and they did it 24 years ago. And so for 24 years at the federal level, we've lived precisely with everybody having the right to come in and say, that substantially burdens my religion, and I want to challenge it. Um, and for the most part, until Hobby Lobby, most people didn't know what RIFRA was. Um, the sky hasn't fallen. Um, I love Justice Scalia, but he was just flat out wrong. It's not anarchy. It's simply allowing the minority to live according to her rights. Hey, one of the great Bill, joys. any uh, follow-up? Bill. One of the great joys of coming to the Federal Society is I get to defend Justice Scalia against attacks <laughs> like that one. <laughs> We're happy to have you here. Uh, let me give you a case that came up recently. A foreign national seeking immigration status here wanted to get out of the requirement that he, sh that he shows that he, that he could, was making, would be able to make a living wage by saying that he believed he could live by faith. <laughs> How should we decide that under the compelling interest test? If you decide it under the compelling interest test the way Justice Alito said to do that in, in, uh, in uh, Hobby Lobby is you have to evaluate the United States' interest against one individual. 
You don't evaluate it against all the people who could seek that exemption. You evaluate it against one individual. Under that test, the, the uh, faith adherence is going to win. Uh, the test is, wasn't applied stringently when it existed from Sherbert to Smith. It hasn't been applied stringently since RIFRA went into place in the 1990s. Courts will generally soften the compelling interest test, which is exactly what Justice Scalia predicted would happen. Now, Hobby Lobby gave it a, a great deal of force, but it remains to be seen whether that compelling interest test is going to be able to say, sustain that kind of vibrancy. Because when you say that we are going to defer to the believer's self-referential description of how much they're burdened, and then add to it the fact that you have to show a compelling interest with respect only to that adherent, you've made every law in the United States presumptively unconstitutional, which I know appeals to the libertarians among us, <laughs> but does raise certain kinds of problems. Well, we have about 25 minutes left. I should alert you that at 5 o'clock, we're going to just cut things off because there are events this evening that people need to get prepared for. So the floor is open. We have at least two mics. Maybe there's a third one in the back. I see one in, toward the front, one sort of in the middle. Um, I will um, go back and forth. We'll start with the first mic. But I would ask each of you who wish to speak simply to uh, give us your name and your affiliation before your question. And yes, questions are invited. Generalized comments are discouraged. So <laughs> you may go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll beg the moderator's indulgence to provide an answer to uh, Professor Marshall as, I, as an intro to my question. After, after you give us your name and affiliation. Sorry, Chris Hollinger, and uh, I'll say I'm affiliated with the Hampton Roads Lawyers Chapter now since I'm a region Very alum as of, uh, as of May. Um, I, I would submit to the professor that the answer to your hypothetical about the individual who wants to live by faith is we can meet the government's compelling interest of not having them be a ward of the state once they immigrate by giving them the opportunity to sign away any claim to <laughs> government benefits and uh, any future attempt to live off the dole as, as a condition of them coming in and then keep track of that in some way in, in our massive government bureaucracy that would, uh, would dole out those benefits. My, uh, my question to you, Professor, is uh, it, it, I, I completely agree with your concerns about the, this difficulty in, in you know, every crazy possible religious exemption to every possible rule that might come up. Um, I wonder, though, it, what you think about the, the proposition that that is basically, that the fact that that conflict exists is an argument for less government regulation of life. And then the problem, we're having these problems because we're trying to regulate so much of life and we're trying to dictate so much of individual life through government action. And there's a question mark at the end. Yes, it, what, what, do, do you think that that's an argument okay. against the increased regulation? Well, yeah. now obviously government has expanded, as population expands, there are more challenges. You can't let everybody build wherever they want to build without creating serious kinds of environmental concerns. Are, are we overregulated in some areas? Sure. Um, nobody, I don't think anybody is going to deny that. They might disagree which areas there are. The, the reason why I use the example of the military, though, is we've needed the military since the beginning. This is one of the most powerful claims for religious exemption there is. But if we applied that, if we just said that anybody who was making a religious claim should be exempted from the draft, it would cause serious problems, not just that other people would have to serve for the people who didn't, but of the exact kinds of problems that the opinion in Gillette was getting at was that how do you keep morale up among those who are actually fighting if it doesn't really look you, like you have a fair system? Question from the second mic, the middle mic, it looks like. Go ahead. Judge John Eastman, the Chapman yes. University and the Claremont Institute. The main theme of this conference is administrative agencies in the regulatory state. In this panel, we're kind of talking about how much of the contraceptive mandate should be carved out uh, for religious groups. But in fact, there is no contraceptive mandate in the, Amer in the Affordable Care Act. It's derived out of a language by Barbara Mikulski, and when she was challenged on this preventive care language that it would lead to abortion-inducing drugs, she specifically disclaimed it. So my question for you all is, hasn't the administrative state gone off the rails here, and is there any pushback about these regulations that were never properly authorized by the statute in the first place? Volunteer answers? 
Sure, I, I'll at least take a first shot, Mark, which Mark, is, Mark, go ahead. Um, which is, sure, um, but I think ultimately the problem, as uh, I guess Roger said earlier, is with the Affordable Care Act, right? The Affordable Care Act does say that the health, what, HRSA, Health Research Services Administration within HHS, can decide what preventive care is. Um, Congress, I think, made a big mistake to punt that sort of big issue to an agency. Now, one solution might be that Trump's HRSA should simply say, no, contraceptives are widely available. That's not necessary preventive care. In this version of the IFR, they didn't. They said, we'll try to go for a compromise. We'll leave the mandate in place for most people, but we'll have a religious exemption. It'll be very interesting to see if any of those blue state lawsuits against the IFR win, if the courts tell Trump, look, you can't have an exemption for religious people here. It violates the Establishment Clause. One answer to that is, okay, well then we're not having a contraceptive mandate. And that would be perfectly within the blank check that the ACA wrote. And it, it's important to note that the, the Affordable Care Act did not require contraceptive coverage. HHS did not have to do what it did. Um, because it didn't have to do what it did, HHS is empowered to do what it did this time, take it back. So if you, don't have, you didn't have to do it, you could also take it back using that same authority. And in the IFR, we listed all the many reasons why being solicited is to religious freedom and moral conviction. Uh, important to note that we are taking comments on the question of publicly traded corporations and moral convictions, and the comment period is still open for that. And one final point on the, the corporation issue, um, and First Amendment rights. So Time Warner and Fox, they're, they're big corporations, and nobody would argue they don't have First Amendment rights, and the same should apply when it comes to other First Amendment rights like religious freedom. Any other response? Um, Melissa? Well, as, as Mark recognized, I think it is a federally, the contraception coverage is a federally mandated benefit because HRSA came to this decision as when Congress punted the decision to them. Uh, I do think, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a doctor, but it, it, I do know that the abortion rate has fallen uh, over the last uh, eight, eight or so years and that having contraception easily accessible to people uh, is part of uh, fighting abortion and unintended pregnancies and that um, some, of the, some of the most effective methods of contraception are the most expensive methods. So I think just simply saying that people can go out and find contraception coverage somehow uh, without ensuring that it's available um, in a cost-free way to women could have a very uh, bad effect on, on unintended pregnancies and abortions, and I think that's worth considering as something that HRSA did consider. And then just to go back on the point um, that you were making, Mark, earlier about grandfathered plans, and, you know, I do, I think I remember correctly, and you correct me if I'm wrong, that in one of the briefs to the Supreme Court, the, those that were challenging um, the accommodation, some of them were saying that, you know what, we could have an expansion of Title X that would provide cost-free contraception coverage to any woman who does not get contraception coverage through her health plan. And so I, I'm in a quandary as to why the administration didn't even try to do that with a republicanly controlled Congress to encourage that kind of coverage, which would have covered people in grandfathered plans as well as people uh, working for uh, uh, other plans that did not get contraception coverage due to religious objectors, religious objections. Next question from the front mm -hmm. mic. Uh, Ron Rotunda, Chapman University. We didn't plan this, it just, it just happened one after the other. Um, Hillary never po uh, apologized for calling me deplorable. Uh, <laughs> when we're talking about the presidential candidates making apologies, but, that's, but, I, but, I, but my question is this. The, I, 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 I don't understand, because I mean, we are talking about the power of the administrative state. Let's say it's a great idea to have a board of fashions. Nothing prevents state or federal government from reining those from the cloud. They could put vending machines in every corner, put in a penny and get your board of fashion. So how does the administration, in terms of administrative law, make the decision that is very important for the little sisters of the poor. We have to rub their nose into it. They have to provide the abortive fashions. We can't just give it to them as, as the federal government. And, and HHS gets to this by saying pregnancy is a disease and abortive, interesting, and abortive fashions are the cure. Let me clue you in. I'm not a scientist either, but I know once you're pregnant, abortions don't cure it. They don't cure the pregnancy. They, they prevent the birth, 
but they don't cure the pregnancy. So how, how can we justify in a democracy to have the administrators making all these little jumps of logic and when the easy answer is have the federal government reign abortifacient expensive plans or, or, or whatever, just, just give it to them directly because that has no constitutional problem. You know, pacifists have to pay taxes even though we use their taxes for cruise missiles. Okay, there's a question mark at the end of that. So the, <laughs> the <laughs> who would like to respond? Uh, thank you. Oh, yeah. the, the previous administration argued when it issued its earlier rules that contraceptive was a cost saver overall. So in essence, it was arguing that we don't need a mandate at all. It's in the economic interest of all insurers to provide it for free. Well, if that's the case, they'll be providing it for free and then the problem disappears. Uh, one thing to clarify, even though the HHS has the authority to, to take out the mandate completely, it has not. The, the mandate is still there. It, it expanded the religious exemption. What we're saying is 99.9% .9 of women are completely unaffected by the new rules. And of those women that may be affected, many of them are working for nuns. So you would imagine that they're probably going to be aligned um, on these issues in many ways. So um, the grandfathering issue is this giant problem um, it, it, for those who want expanded contraceptive access that, that you, it makes you wonder why you're picking on the religious organizations as somehow the source of a major problem. And if I could just add one other point. I'm sorry, can you right there? But one, one other point on that is I do think one of the problems here is the Obama administration's insistence that it must come through the employer. In other words, if the administration was serious about making this stuff widely available, and if the administration said, well, you know, there's some that are really expensive, we want to make them available, they could have made it available in a way that wasn't directly connected to your employer and your boss. Um, they chose not to, right? Even though there were, again, many, many times more, tens of millions of people who didn't have that coverage through their secular employer, and the administration didn't do anything about it, right? That just makes it really hard to believe that there's some compelling need to force it to come through your religious employer. Bill, did you have something? Yes, I'm failing miserably. I said what we should do is try to discuss religious liberty issues outside the culture wars, and we are just talking <laughs> about it in the culture wars. The interesting thing about the Smith case is, when, is that when the Native Americans lost that case and were not allowed to practice a religion and do a religious practice that they had been doing for over 100 years, there wasn't a big, uh, a big reaction on behalf of the Native Americans. There was nobody saying they really are being hurt here. Um, if you're going to take religious exemptions seriously, you have to take them seriously. And that doesn't just mean with majoritarian religions. It means that you have to recognize objections to war. It means that when small churches want to engage in sanctuary and shield illegal immigrants, you might have to take their claims seriously. So what I'm, what I'm suggesting here is that let's think about this in a different kind of context. Uh, Justice Scalia, when he decided Smith, decided it in a cultural neutral, a, a culture war neutral context. I think it would be more helpful for us to evaluate religion and all of these arguments we're making if we tried to imagine religious views that maybe we were not sympathetic with against the government policy that we were. A uh, question from the back, Mike. Yes, thank you. Uh, Joe Crosby, I'm in private practice in Washington, D.C. Um, I was um, interested in and encouraged to some degree uh, what Ms. Rogers had to say about trying to get across uh, the aisle, you know, across and, and develop a um, generalized approach. But I don't think that you could find anything that would be a greater success for that kind of thing than RIFRA passed 24 years ago under President Clinton with I think probably 400 votes in the House. And yet now it seems to be a kind of lightning rod for a lot of concerns, and governors who try to pass uh, similar legislation in their own states are running into major problems. Are there principles that will allow us to reach agreement, not only, you know, reach agreement for right now, but that would be long-standing and, uh, and stable over a long period of time, and not just a few years? Yeah, Melissa, thanks ahead. for the question. Um, yeah, I think there are. I think there are, there are a lot of areas where we can work. It is more challenging than it was during RIFRA days, and that's for a lot of complicated reasons, some of which you mentioned, and we can talk more about others later. But, for example, there was a successor law to RIFRA called the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. It really rolls off the tongue. Known as RELUPA. 
Um, and we were able, actually, Bill was instrumental in working on that when he was in the Clinton White House. And certainly, I think we all, or at least your predecessors, we worked on that bill together that became law that says that um, we need to protect uh, religious institutions from over, uh, over or unnecessary zoning and land use matters and also protect religious people in institutionalized settings, including in prisons, to be able to exercise their faith. And that law had very strong support. Um, it has done real good in the context of religious institutions trying to locate in storefront churches, for example, and, and being able to beat back zoning and land use uh, regulation that is, not, that is uh, keeping them out, and also protecting minority faiths, including uh, Muslims who have had difficulty and kind of lurking discrimination against them and trying to cite their houses of worship. So that's done real good. It's been supported by people across uh, ideology, politics, faith. And recently we found, I think through some articles, that there might be a lot more education we could do around RELUPA and maybe even in time strengthen certain parts of that law. I cite that just to say there are these examples. Another example is religious garb in the military. Um, there's been a very, very good work done by the Beckett Fund and others, and I worked on it during the Obama administration, uh, this policy to allow, um, for example, the uh, six to wear a modified turban and a modified beard while they serve so they don't have to give up their faith in order to serve their country. So, that's just, those are just two examples of ways in which I think we can continue to work toward common ground, but it's gonna take a real concerted effort in this polarized culture for us to make progress. I still am hopeful that we can do so. Bill? Yeah, the, it's an interesting history here because after Smith was decided, the left and the right came together in a, in a kumbaya moment and passed RIFRA. There was, a, there was slight objections, by the way, from the Catholic Church that were worried that if Roe versus Wade was overturned and abortion was made illegal, they didn't want it to be possible for somebody to get a religious exemption from an anti-abortion statute. So they weren't, a full a, lot of, they weren't a full part of that coalition. What happened after RIFRA was that uh, there, there were really two kind of frames in, in RIFRA. Some had overlapping reasons, but from the left, a lot of it was protecting minorities, minority groups, minority religions, and from from the right, it was just sort of protecting religiosity. Now, many had both of those concerns, but after RIFRA was struck, struck down as applied to the states in Bernie, the issue of how is this gonna to apply to civil rights laws began to become apparent. And that's why when the coalition came back that Melissa was talking about, the only agreement could be forged only along those very limited lines because it was concerned that, uh, that, that there shouldn't be an exemption created from civil rights laws. Now, many religious issues don't involve those kind of things, and there I think we still see a great deal of overlap. I think, Roger? Yeah, I do. So, <clears throat> President Trump had pledged, if presented to him by Congress, that he would sign the Conscience Protection Act and the First Amendment Defense Act, which are two concrete ways of, of furthering uh, religious freedom and protection of moral convictions. Uh, and the question was how to institutionalize. So statutes is one way, and changing the culture of federal agencies is another. I was at DOJ Civil Rights. Uh, I'm now the head of the Civil Rights Office at HHS. And civil rights is woven in through and through federal agencies. It is everywhere in our policies, in uh, documents that have to be signed by grant recipients, just through and through. Religious freedom and protection of religious and moral conviction is not in the same way, but it is a civil right. And it needs to be integrated into the culture of federal agencies much in the same way. And I think that's one of the ways we can make it more permanent and lasting. Question from the front mic. Hi, I'm Rachel Frank from the Yale Student Chapter. Uh, so I have a question about an interesting, or what I've seen as an interesting development in religious freedom law, and that's this new expansion past either sort of religious or metaphysical Could I beliefs. ask you to speak just a little louder, please? Sure, so my question is about the expansion, or what I've seen as an expansion of religious freedom from uh, religious or metaphysical beliefs about the world into some factual beliefs about the world. And I think a very interesting example is one we've been talking about with the contraception mandate. And there's incredibly good evidence that, um, with one exception being the copper IUD, that almost all contraceptions will not have any effect on a fertilized egg and therefore can't cause abortion. 
So with this strong factual backdrop, religious opposition to facts, I'm wondering if we, think, if we should think that religious opposition to factual statements about the world might be different than religious opposition to metaphysical beliefs about the world. Who wants to try that? Sure. Um, Mark. So two things. One, I, I would just say um, I don't think the factual statements you're making are entirely accurate about the scientific evidence. Um, and I would just say the Obama administration and the manufacturers of those drugs uh, agree with me that many of those drugs can cause an early abortion. They at least don't think they can rule it out enough to not put it on the label. So when the religious folks are saying, I can't provide people with that drug because it says it might cause abortions, they're not making it up. They're trusting what the Obama FDA said and what the drug manufacturer said. So it's not, it's not the moon is made of green cheese. It's a serious scientific statement based on what the drug manufacturers and the administration said. Um, but otherwise, I would say ultimately the question, does somebody have a religious objection to buying somebody a certain drug? Um, comes, comes down to the sincerity of, of the religious belief, right? So that ultimately, um, you know, we may all have different religious beliefs about things, but if someone has a religious belief that God forbids me to do X, right? God forbids me to, you know, provide a death penalty drug, you know, to provide a drug that might be used in the death penalty, even though it turns out it's not directly going to a state. I don't know, right? Somebody could have those beliefs. And ultimately, I do think that the way we analyze it under RIFRA and the free exercise clause is we look to see do we have a sincerely held religious objection? Sometimes we won't, oftentimes we won't, right? Judges are actually very good um, in a lot of contexts at looking and saying, I don't think that's really a sincere religious belief. They do that in prison context quite a bit. Um, but ultimately it comes down to, does this person have a sincere religious belief that they can't do X? And in the contraceptive mandate case, there was really no dispute. The government never challenged it. Nobody else ever challenged it either. These people sincerely believe that they would be violating God's will if they gave somebody access to these things. So we can think, they're wrong, they're uneducated, but ultimately their religion requires them to do that as much as an Orthodox Jew's religion requires them not to flip the light switch or do something else. And um, generally speaking, I don't think the government ought to be second guessing people on those things. Bill. Yeah, sincerity is a very thin reed to defend on because as Justice Jackson pointed out in a particular case, you can't judge sincerity without judging the believability. It was a case dealing with mail fraud with somebody who claimed that they, that they could cure people by by faith, and they were prosecuted by mail fraud case called U.S. versus Ballard from 1944. And Justice, ju uh, and, and, and Justice uh, Jackson said, you can't really judge sincerity without judging believability. So some beliefs are gonna be deemed more believable than others, but if you do that, you're engaging in what is clearly a First Amendment problem of, of a judging the validity of particular religions. So, so what fact, I mean, Mark is probably right in the, in the prison context, but in most cases, courts do not investigate sincerity very, very, very closely, and it's really hard to do. Take the Thomas case where somebody claimed, a Jehovah's Witness claimed that he had an objection to working in an armaments factory. It's not part of the Jehovah's Witnesses' tenets. Um, was that really a religious belief, or was it really a moral belief? Um, who's to know? Maybe even Thomas didn't know. I would venture to say that many of us don't know the basis of some of our strongest beliefs. It's a very difficult inquiry. I'm not sure it's that much of a protection against strategic claims for religious exemptions. And, well, just, here, uh, any further questions? Yeah, so one, over here. one right question right. on, on uh, follow-up on that. If a religious belief says uh, the founder of my religion flew from one place to another how many years ago, a thousand years ago. And if somebody says, well, actually that, that doesn't happen, planes weren't invented then, so therefore your religious belief cannot be true and insincere. We don't want government to be in a position to be second guessing people's religious beliefs by making factual arguments and say, but no, it can't possibly be because X, Y, and Z. Um, only different considerations come into play under the RIFRA standard as a compelling government interest, et cetera, et cetera. We go down a very slippery and dangerous slope to, to be trying to question factual bases of religious beliefs. People could have religious beliefs that we disagree with um, that we think are not based in fact, but they still have the right to that belief and to live according to them. I would agree with that, just making the point that under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, uh, there has to be a substantial burden on a sincere religious practice. So in addition to you know, this, this interesting conversation we're, we're having about sincerity and what that means. We also have an interesting conversation going on in the courts and elsewhere about whether there should be total deference to the religious believers sense that they are being substantially burdened 
or whether there should be substantial deference but not total deference and some consideration of that as a legal category that can be determined by the courts uh, even in a contradiction to the religious believers uh, assertion that their practices are being substantially burdened. Please join me in thanking our panel.